Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Dwayne Deskins, and I'm the first assistant prosecuting attorney here in Cuyahoga County and a proud member of the Edwins Leadership and Restaurant Institute Board of Directors. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, the founder and CEO of Edwins, Brandon Krutowski. Ladies and gentlemen, the Federal Bureau of Investigation estimates that nearly one out of every three Americans has a criminal record of some type. Think about that. One in every three. Many of these individuals were incarcerated and when released from prison faced tremendous barriers in attempting to integrate back into society. These barriers, many of us, take for granted. Renewing a driver's license, establishing a bank account, writing or updating a resume, or securing a job all become difficult, if not impossible, for those returning from prison. And without support, they often return to a life of crime, an often unbreakable cycle of recidivism. The situation I just described may seem hopeless to many of us, but not to Brandon Krutowski. As a teenager in Detroit, Michigan, Mr. Krutowski entered a potential encountered a potential prison sentence after running from the police when they arrived to disperse a gathering involving drugs. Instead, he was given probation rather than a decade-long prison sentence, and that crucial moment set the course for the rest of his career. Trained at the Culinary Institute of America and certified by the Court of Master Sommeliers, Ms. Krasowski worked at some of the finest restaurants in New York City, in Chicago, and Paris before arriving here in Cleveland in 2008 to work for Zach Burrell's French restaurant, Labertros Brasserie. At the same time, he decided to focus on his passion of training formerly incarcerated men and women in the culinary arts, working with local leaders in philanthropy, in the restaurant industry, and with people in the reentry community. Ms. Krutowski opened Edwins, which is a shortened version of the slogan, Education Wins, at a location in Shaker Square in late 2013. The rigorous program offers training in all aspects of the hospitality industry, from cooking skills to serving skills, from bartending to hosting. Students train during the day, and they practice their skills at that high-end French restaurant in the evening. Since its opening, Edwin's has been lauded as one of Cleveland's best restaurants and has turned out 89 graduates. <laughs> and many of whom work at restaurants here across the greater Cleveland area. But this success is not enough for Mr. Krutowski. He recently purchased three buildings in Cleveland's east side to house Edwin's Second Chance Life Skills Center, which consists of a dormitory-style housing for the students who do not have a home. In a recent Cleveland.com article, Ms. Krutowski said, if we're ever going to change this perception of reentry, we have got to do the impossible. And if anyone can do the impossible, my bet is on Brandon Krutowski, my friend, and most recently, my cousin-in-law. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club, please welcome the founder and CEO of Edwin's Leadership and Restaurant Institute, Mr. Brandon Krutowski. Thank you. Well, I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm not really an emotional guy, but um, well, I work a lot, see, and I don't get out that much, and I really didn't know what this meant to everybody. There's a lot of people here that, um, that have supported us along the way. Uh, Cordell, the, the followers, Dick, 
I've got uh, two classmates here, people from ODRC. Um, Jill, I don't know how far you drove, but there's a, a tremendous space here today, and um, well, we got a tremendous mission, so thank you. You know, the first time I came to City Club was in 2013, and uh, you know, Dan invited me. It was for a re-entry um, you know, conversation. Uh, Charles, uh, one of the men who've paved the way in this town from Luther Metropolitan Ministries, was here, he was here with James Walker, and uh, I forget the last, Senator Shirley Smith. Charles, you probably remember. Well, that conversation um, drew maybe a third of this room full, and it wasn't anything that, uh, that any of the speakers did uh, incorrectly. It was just the climate. It was our community. And now today on Yom Kippur, a big holiday, uh, we sold the place out. So it's a testament to where we stand and what we believe in. So I can't thank you enough. I can't thank every one of you enough. Thank you. I want to thank um, all the distinguished members of the City Club here, the Cleveland City Club, for the privilege of sharing the reentry mission of Edwins, and also the challenge we face in making America true to its original purpose. And that purpose is to allow every single American, regardless of their background or personal history, the right to happiness creativity, and the opportunity to work with dignity. And when Dwayne rings this bell, this historic city club bell, what that is, it's a, it's a call to action. I hear American fairness and tolerance. I also see the fight. People incarcerated, both behind bars and just in difficult circumstances of life, striving to hope and trying to re-enter a more forgiving and inclusive world. For me, the sound of that bell is a call to action. It's you and I working together to call Cleveland to its conscious. And I've got a particular reentry program, Edwin's Leadership and Restaurant Institute, a now proven reentry model that I want to share with you today. Because the truth is, we need to change the face of reentry in this country, right? We've got a problem out there. And you know that I'm talking about the reentry of newly released incarcerated individuals and giving to each a genuine tool a real prospect of healthy and redemptive work. It works. I can tell you today, without a doubt, without any hesitation, that it's a positive step. I've taken it. I've helped devise it. And I've seen it change the face of some of the most complex, overlooked, and morally urgent transitions in this society. My goal today is to share that voice of those incarcerated and the many more who have returned home and ask you today, in the oldest Forum, America's oldest forum, Dan told me today, to ask you to join the fight, in, in the fight to create a fair and equal opportunity. Because when you give someone coming out of the darkness of prison, someone who is ready to dream again, someone who's ready for renewal, a chance to believe in themselves, then that person's won, and we all move forward. That's the pragmatic approach to the civil rights dream. And it can begin, it can begin here in Cleveland. Now, a number of the peers have already stepped forward with their support and blessing. I'm not trying to sell you something that's not a proven fact, something that hasn't changed lives in this city, across the state. I'm not here asking for your money. I'm here asking for your moral currency. And it can begin here in Cleveland. We can change the face of reentry simply by how we hire and who we mentor. And let me tell you how big of an impact we can truly have. Across the nation, we have, in the United States, 5% of the world's population, yet we have 25% of the prison population. Now, I'm not saying that we're taking and, and uh, putting people in prison without due process or unjustly. I'm just simply asking you to do the arithmetic. 5% of the world's population, yet 25% of the prison population. And something else we should consider, right now at this moment, we have 2.3 million people behind bars. In Ohio, 50,000. And if you take the whole parole, probation, jail system, you have a separate nation of 6 million people in this country who have suffered from imprisonment. Now, if that's not enough, globally, we incarcerate five to eight times more than any other country, causing a $74 billion problem that cripples and undermines our already fragile economy. You know, this is, this is incredible. Where's Terry at? Terry Mills. Terry, thanks for the tie, by the way. John Carroll. (laughs) 
we, we spend right now six times more in prison than we do on higher education. That's startling, isn't it? But I want to remind you, I'm not here to tell, argue the justice system, argue sentencing reform. Without a doubt, people belong in prison. And some people need this uh, to rehabilitate while they pay their time and debt to society. However, one bad decision should not influence someone's entire life. It's time to break the cycle. Dwayne mentioned recidivism. And for those of you who don't know what this is, it's not a spice. It's, not, <laughs> it's, it's a real problem we have. Recidivism is the rate at which someone returns back to prison. And currently, within three years, across the United States, we're looking at 43%. So 43% of the 650,000 people who are released will return back to prison in three years. Ohio, they're kicking ass, 27%. Just a little over. But in Cuyahoga County, we're at about 37%. So we got a little work to do, too. Even law officials agree. It's time to break the cycle. It's time for a fair and equal opportunity. Personally, not a day goes by that I don't think that should have been me. What could have been or what should have been, I'm sure many of you feel this way or thought about the road that could have happened. I asked myself, why was I spared? I can't tell you why I was more fortunate than others, but I can tell you for certain what enabled me to succeed was the desire for a better tomorrow. I had a gracious judge and an even more amazing mentor who taught me it wasn't practice that makes perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect. But that desire for a better tomorrow fueled me. It fueled me for 10 years in trying to build Edwin's, and it continues to fuel me today. It's the same desire I see in Grafton when we teach on the weekends. It's the same desire I see at Edwin's when everyone's trying their best. It's the same desire I see out of our staff. It's the same desire I see when visiting prisons, Richland, Chillicothe, Toledo, all over the state. It's the same damn desire that you have when you want to make it better for yourself. And I don't know about you, but there's no sweeter feeling than getting the opportunity to change. And there are many people, many more than you could imagine, that have that desire and they need that opportunity. I hear it in letters, in phone calls, from people incarcerated, from those already home, from parents, from children. Across the board, I hear the same voice. We are here, we are ready, and we intend to succeed if given the opportunity. And finding a way to create an opportunity for this desire was the inspiration for Edwin's. This is how it began. First, I knew what an opportunity could do. And second, I knew that a restaurant could change the world because it changed mine. Edwin's is Hope. It's a six-month training program in a fine dining restaurant that teaches men and women the fundamentals of culinary arts and hospitality. Each student not only gets business basics, but elite training in every position at real speed. We teach to the top to get the best, and we don't say no to anyone who applies. We serve frog legs, we also play Motown. <laughs> we're fine dining, but we're unpretentious. And any given night, you'll hear Earth, Wind, and Fire <laughs> and drink a fine Bordeaux. <laughs> and students get more than this extraordinary opportunity in culinary arts, they also get the business basics and how to run a sustainable business. They know how to measure food cost. They know how to make a profit. It's very important to be transparent with our financials and be part of a conversation on how we can all make this a sustainable endeavor. And with this, we get a tremendous amount of ownership, an extreme amount of pride, an amazing culture of care. And the support, that's what we're here for. So it's not just the education, it's the support. So from our chefs to our case manager, we have a culture of care. We make it happen, and we got their backs. Whether it's legal trouble, whether it's uh, addiction, no matter what it may be, we're going to solve that problem. We're going to solve it fast. And that program at Edwin's also takes place in Grafton Prison. We're fortunate enough to have a couple of uh, individuals from Grafton today. Mr. Carson, Mr. Johnson, thank you for making it. And
And Jimmy and Adam, um, I'll tell you, of, of our class in Grafton Prison, uh, probably the two brightest students, except for Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy, you're getting there, though. <laughs> also, Lieutenant Gaddon, Unit Manager Adam Kassler, Ron M. Brewster, are all here to represent what we do in Grafton Prison every weekend. You see, it's not just about teaching the skill or giving this, um, this whole uh, rah-rah about what's right and what's best. We're truly changing the way a skill is being taught in prison. We're allowed to bring our own knives in. We have our own pots and pans, induction burners, china. I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine this 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago? It's happening now, though. With the, uh, with the support of ODRC, Ohio Dep Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, it's happening today. With John's support, with Adam's support, with Ron, we're able to teach to the top because what we found is any student who takes our program in Grafton over those eight months, when they're released, there's no trouble finding them work because they know how to really cut. They know how to really cook. It's a skill just like Edwin's. It's excellence. So why the name Edwin's? And Dwayne told you the big part about this. It's education winning. I believe if we can educate on all levels, we can do this. It also happens to be my middle name. <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> my grandfather's name was Edwin, and I inherited it from him. And I didn't know him. I was four years old when he passed. But his stories still get passed around the table. He was a real son of a bitch. <laughs> he, was, he had iron in his blood, and he had a strong back. That spirit of Edwin's is no different than what we need to make this succeed. We need hard work. We need determination. We need grit. And that was Edwin. And we also need this education winning. Because if we can educate on all levels, we can change the face of reentry. We can start a civil rights movement right here in Cleveland by having these conversations, by talking about what we can do or what we can't do and how can we change that. There's three major levels we try to educate on. The first is our student. And we have a few students here today as well. I know Craig's right here, and there may be another one in the crowd. Anyone else make it? No problem. They're in class. It's good. <laughs> it's good. We try to educate our students to fulfill their potential. And this is a very important thing. And what does that mean, fulfilling potential? It does no good managing someone and their ability the way they have it now. You're only getting maybe 10 or 20% out of someone. But if you can manage what they're capable of, then you're exceeding exceeding what that's, what's possible. And not only that, educating in culinary arts and hospitality through the lens of someone who's had a brush with the past offers a new perspective, okay? And that perspective now creates a new reality. And when you give someone a new reality, you've got fire. So our students. Second, it's our diners. Many people come to Edwin's and don't even know what we're about until the check comes. And there you have it. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, and they wonder, well, what do you mean? And we explain, and they're blown away. And a lot of diners come because they know what we're about. And we, can, we constantly change that perspective of our diner in thinking what's possible for someone who comes out of prison. I'm sure it's changed many people already, maybe in this room. When you think of someone coming out of prison, you think you have this, this you know, kind of calloused, uh, uh, you know, media-pushed mentality of what it looks like and what it is. But instead, you come to Edwin's, you're getting duck confit with Bordeaux, and they're decanting the bottle, and it's an amazing experience. So through our diners. And lastly, is in prison. Making sure that every person behind bars knows that someone out here has got your back, and that if you want it, there's a better tomorrow. Those three areas help change the face of reentry. And my approach is very simple. First, offer a fair and equal opportunity. Second, teach to the top. Third, care more. And lastly, when you see a problem, fix it. Nothing in between. And with that, we've developed not only this culture of care, but a true support system and a true foundation for someone to stand on. And it's simple. This is pragmatic. I, I tell you, I grew up as a chef and a cook. I and mean, We peel carrots and, and onions and chop them. It's not... Hard. What we're trying to do here is just offer that opportunity and support someone once they're ready for it. From the beginning, we never asked questions about the previous offense. Our interview process, everyone asks, well, how do you do this? How do you do that? 
it's very simple. We give an opportunity. When we work their ass off the first three weeks, it's not easy. We put people through culinary math, through serve safe and safety and sanitation, through gastronomy, through nutrition. We're asking people to get up at 9 a.m. and leave at 4 o'clock. We're not letting off the gas. But if someone's willing to work hard, the opportunity is theirs. There's one thing I learned when I worked in France. When I went there, I didn't speak the language. But it was quickly understood that I worked harder than anyone in that kitchen, and I got an opportunity. Hard work has no language. It has no language. It's much like love. So if you can just demand the most out of someone and give them support and this fair and equal opportunity, you have yourself a new reality. And slowly we change reentry. One person, one day, one diner at a time. And we quietly demand they work hard and give it their all. And we know that people are passionate and we don't want to create barriers. A lot of people just came from that. So it's really important to outline a very good culture. And what does that look like? The first thing I did when Edwin's, uh, the, the real estate became available and the ink dried, the first thing I did was pull out the cameras. There was cameras from the last restaurant. Pulled them all out, done. Um, the second thing was, we'll clean the place up and make it look good, right? A lot of people think you need these HR departments. In HR departments, there's a, there's a time and place for them. When you have a big machine or many companies, I understand the approach to an HR department. But when you have a healthy culture, when you have a culture that is uh, self-governing, when you have pride and when you see it every day, there's no need for an HR department. So no cameras, no HR department, just hard work and pride. And so far, so good. And things happen, I'll be honest. It's not perfect. It's no different than any other restaurant or any other business. But I'll tell you that we do not surrender to fear. We can't. When something happens or goes wrong, we respond like a family. We build a new support system. And we look at someone's approach and how they're thinking. If someone, re, uh, someone relapses and goes back to heroin or goes back to the drugs, the first thing we do is we find a sponsor. The second, we plan for a better tomorrow. The third, we talk every day. Every day we talk. And we're trying to get someone away from what's not making them fill their potential. If someone gets thrown back in jail for probation violation, you know, if they, don't, if they drop dirty, if they, uh, they don't show up, or whatever the circumstance may be, the first thing is we visit. We go visit them. We drop off our books, and we say we're waiting for you to come back. Simple as that. You know, sometimes forgiveness isn't one time or seven times. Sometimes it's 77 times. Right? We all have that problem. But at Edwin's, if you're willing to work hard, you show up every day, it's yours. And what that's done is create an amazing culture, an amazing community. We have 35 restaurants in the waiting list right now to hire. 35. That translates into 140 jobs. <laughs> We're simply empowering willing minds and giving the right direction, teaching to the top. And one thing that's always impressed no dream is too big, and no person is too small. Last year, we sent someone to Normandy. This year, we sent someone to Boston. They love cheese. We sent them to a cheese shop. Right? We sent someone to a Michelin three-star restaurant in Chicago. They work for Grace. So when someone says, hey, we're here and we're ready, it's simple. We pick up the phone, we call some of our donors, and they make it happen. Easy as that. Now, for almost two years, we've been open. I know it's not maybe not as easy as that, but <laughs> when they're sitting there, I mean, you got to, <laughs> they make it look as easy as that. <laughs> for, for almost two years now, the restaurant's been open, and we've really been kicking ass. We've had over $2 million in restaurant sales. As Dwayne said, one of the premier dining destinations in the city. And we've had some great, great results, most importantly with our students, the 89 graduates, the 98% employment, the 0% recidivism. That's something, right? And a, a lot of individuals will say, Brandon, you're amazing. You're doing amazing. You're doing amazing. You know what? I'm one person in the machine, okay? It may be a lot of sacrifice. It may be long hours. But I've got a team of nine that are doing the same. And we've got 30 students right now in the class that are doing even more. And then we've got 90 alumni who are still paving the way for those 30 that have to come out. 
So it's a whole machine. It's a whole machine of care that keeps pushing forward. It's not just me. I may be the loon who came up with this and said, hey, let's, let's give it a roll. But I'm certainly not every, every person behind this. Our chef right now is with us, Jerry Grimm over here. Our developmental director, Tom Bennett, is with us. I got a great board of directors here that, uh, that love to patronize the restaurant and its wine list. So we, we couldn't be more thankful for, for big stomachs and big pockets. Speaking of big pockets, our donors, our community, and we've had some step forward with an amazing amount of money. It's funny. Everyone has given outside their means. So if someone gives a half million dollars, that's a lot of money. I mean, for some, it might be impossible. It's a lot of money. For someone who gives a dollar and 74 cents, a seven-year-old girl, that's a lot of money. For foundations who give us $65,000, foundations who give us $5,000, it's a lot of money. But the important part is we've never taken state or federal money. I believe it does one thing, and that's suppress our community's involvement. If we take the government's money, nothing wrong with it, just saying, if we do, that forces us not to get out. We need to come and get out and meet you and explain to you what's going on, and we need your skin in the game. Now, whether that's your furniture you want to donate, whether it's your, your, your night out in the town, whether it's your money, whatever it is, we need that personal skin because that's the only thing that's going to move this rights movement forward. It's not just going to be a check and you're done or here you go. It needs that involvement. And I can tell you that the donors who are here today are in the restaurant two or three times a month. Last year, Char Fowler, planting mums out front. Okay? I mean, this is not just something that, that people say, here, go. It's also, how can we help? Um, it's an amazing community we have here. And it works. It really works here in Cleveland. It's practical. It's not a set of speeches. It's a set of solutions. It's really about hope and about healing. To continue our success, though, we're going to need to do more. We're going to need to continue to take chances. What's made Edwin so cutting edge and so exciting is that uh, we really have this philosophy of shoot, aim, fire. All right? We build a car where we're going 60 miles an hour. You've probably heard it at all. We continue to take these chances. There's no uh, equation. There's no measurement. There's no overthinking this. There's no spinning the glass four times. Just drink the water. Simple. But we need to continue to take these chances. The first is the, the um, inception of the Edwin's Life Sk uh, Second Chance Life Skills Center. A 20,000 square foot campus, which is three buildings, one for current students who get free housing. The second, an alumni house for graduates. If they have trouble finding a job or finding work for subsidized rent, they can get in there. No problem. And the last building is a fitness center and library. We're building our own community. If no one's going to give us one or let us into one, we'll build the damn things ourselves. Okay? And that vision... That would be my grandfather speaking right now. <laughs> we continue to take these chances, not only here in Cleveland, at Edwin's, but also in prison. I can't tell you again about ODRC's support. I can't underemphasize how important it is they let us do what we do on a weekly basis. There's very few prisons who let this happen. But they've even taken it a step further. They've got a great center called the Hope Center at Grafton Re uh, Reintegration Center. And what happens there is they have a video conference room, videotaping, editing, the whole nine. For the last three months, they've let three inmates come out to Edwin's. We've recorded every lesson, from Bernays to Bechamel to how to cut a carrot, what a Julianne looks like, hospitality, wine, beer, everything, 20 hours of film. They edit it in a 10-disc CD series, and that's being distributed over all 30 prisons in Ohio. Okay? Our curriculum and textbook, Ms. Boswell back there, is, is at this moment, well, not really, but... At this moment, she's having salmon, but she's passing out every curriculum and textbook to all 30 institutions. So we're not just talking about this hope that you can have, oh, hope, hope, hope. We're offering a way to achieve it. You can be in prison, incarcerated, and turn on the Hope Network. This is the prison channel here in Northeast Ohio. And you can watch our chef make something. 
And then you can go to your library and read the book, and then go to our curriculum and take a test on it. We can do JPay. That's a way for someone in prison to communicate via email. And we correspond back and forth, back and forth. We've got an address. So the goal here is this. Plant these seeds. Plant these seeds of hope inside prison. Continue to build outside of prison. And have a place to receive someone. And that's the ultimate dream. That's the ultimate pipeline of saying, hey, I did my time. I'm ready for renewal. And if someone in the outside world isn't willing to accept me, I know someone at Edwin's is. The Buckeye neighborhood. That's the, the choice. That's the choice location. And I think I saw John Hopkins here today. John, thank you. John runs the, uh, the CDC there in, in Buckeye. And uh, we've had many conversations. Some lead somewhere, some don't. Uh, but most importantly, the, 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 common, the common thread is progress. And again, the desire for a better tomorrow. So with Edwin's having his campus and driving its, its uh, experience deeper and raising its flag higher, starts with a, this dorm room. It's going to expand into a fish shop and a meat shop on Buckeye. And the idea is threefold, always thinking threefold. The first is we're going to take whole primals of beef, break them down, and distribute. We've got a revenue stream, sustainability. Two, who's breaking down the meat? Well, our chef instructor and the students. The art of butchery is almost gone, right? Well, we'll revive it. So better teaching. And the third... Probably the most important fact is creating jobs and creating community. So on those three levels, we're going to continue to push down Buckeye. Meat shop, fish shop. Who knows? Maybe we can influence some individuals and, and say, hey, how about a mechanic shop, right? Maybe these one of these social enterprises where you're not only teaching how to do mechanics, but you're also giving the community a good service at a discounted rate. Maybe it's demolition. When the lightning demolition is over there, right? Maybe demolition comes into play. I know St. Luke's is over here. Maybe, you know, there's a little conversation to have. Just a thought. Um, you know, Felton from the public library is here. And we've talked about ideas on how to expand a pastry program in one of the library branches. The idea continues to be threefold. Better teaching, sustainability, and a stronger community. Imagine Buckeye being a whole city or a whole town, a whole neighborhood where someone in prison can come home to and feel welcome, be productive, and change their life around after prison. Also, education. Conversations like this are essential. To conversate and talk. Um, ask these difficult questions and see what's possible. If we stop this dialogue, um, we've got a big problem. And I know it's a hot-button topic in politics. Um, Senator Portman, thank you, Karen, for being here. Um, Senator Portman stopped by the restaurant. He spent an hour and a half, and we talked reentry. He spent time with the students. He didn't just check it off his box. Um, I know Cher's been there to have, have dinner. Um, it's good to see these politicians involved and also making the same action that they're speaking with happen. Armand Budish, I know his representative, he couldn't make it as Yom Kippur, but um, Armand's been another big supporter. So continuing to educate. But to really continue this mission, there's four key areas that we need to keep pushing in. The first is with businesses and employment. Not just a willingness to hire, but a business who's actively seeking out the perspective of someone coming home from prison. So don't just say, hey, we're hiring, we're hiring. Actively seek out this perspective. Make a goal, 10% in 10 months, 10% in 10 years. It's a valuable perspective. It's something that I would ask every business to reflect on. The second area is politically. And we talked about how much support locally has been given. But there's two key areas that are having, uh, creating a lot of difficulties. One, collateral sanctions, or sanctions that prohibit someone from doing something that they normally would because of their offense. Well, the collateral sanctions that are hurting the most are the ones that are prohibiting someone to get back into the career that they loved, or a driver's license, or something that would help their growth. We need to have a conversation about how we can take these collateral sanctions and make, it, uh, make them go away, or make them... Um, uh, more of a dialogue around them, okay? Not just here it is, that's it. Conversation. Uh, uh, there's a gentleman here today, and he, you know, he came out of the restaurant. He's got an MBA. He was a head of a Fortune 500 company, and you know, he did something wrong, right? But now he can't even get back into the line of work that he once was in. 
And it, it, it's a terrible, terrible albatross, we could say, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a terrible thing to have this weight on your shoulders and, and, and everything that you worked hard for and sacrificed for taken away and never to be given back again. And it's just not right. So let's talk about that. Let's also talk about indemnifying employers. Right now, an employer is liable for their employee. And if they go out and do something, the employer is the one on the line. Okay? They've tried some acts in Congress where they say, well, here's $4,000 worth of insurance coverage. Or, what are we talking about here? I mean, really, we're talking about a human being, not, not an automobile. We're talking about a human being who is ready to dream again. And we're taking that away because the employer is fearful of hire. So why don't we just indemnify them? Let them hire how they wish, right? I mean, we we kind of tell government what to do, right, by our votes, but we certainly don't have full authority over it. So let's bring that one back to the table. Also, um, our prison systems, and again, I can't be more thankful to have the opportunity that we have every week in Grafton. And this reintegration center, the Hope Center, helps prepare men and at Northeast Reintegration Center, women, for a successful release. It talks about um, resume building. It talks about where you're going to live. There's so many positive things. There's training in not only Braille, but in computers and cooking and so on. Northeast Ohio is setting the pace in Ohio. And if not Ohio, probably the whole United States. And George Will was just out there two weeks ago, and we had conversations. But there's 30 institutions, not three or four. And we need to spread this through all the, all the prisons. And we have, a, we have a great governor and a great director, Gary Moore. But we need to push even harder inside a prison to redefine what's possible. And lastly, our court system. And it's nice being an outsider. Can I just call it like I see it? Okay? We've got a little bit of uh, communication issues. All right? We've got prosecutors. We've got defenders. We've got judges, prosecutors. And there's not one common thread through them all when it comes to someone either getting out early or what to do when they come home. So recently, uh, Judge Nancy Margaret Russo was here today. Uh, we sat in a panel with, with Judge Polster, and, and it was uh, to a bunch of defenders here in, in Cleveland. And it was surprising to hear that the many people that, that they defend, they have no clue what to do when they come home. Okay? There's books out there for this. There's a great going home to stay home book that would help out. There's the, uh, the Urban Leaf. There's Edwin's. There's Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries. So making sure that it's something that's um, available and relevant to all those who are dealing with someone who's been convicted. And also reentry court. We've got to spread the word. Uh, Judge Nancy Margaret Russo, and he, she puts her neck on the line every day. Okay? Getting people out a little bit earlier than they normally would. In the last five years, 211 people that she's granted pre-release for saved the county over $3 million. I, okay, whatever side of the aisle you're on, it's a no-brainer, okay? It's giving someone a healthy return. It's giving our community a healthy um, burden release. It's doing a lot for everyone. So um, getting this court system to communicate. And that's it. I'm keeping it simple. I want, to th I want to tell you that I couldn't be more proud than I am today. Um, it means a lot to see that so many leaders, so many individuals, so many diners, so many donors uh, coming out to support and believe in something that 10 years ago everyone said was impossible. Nine years ago, you're a fool. Eight years ago, get out of the house. <laughs> Seven years ago, when are you going to change? Six years ago, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go down the line, you know, but, but you know, it starts with one, and then more, and then a lot more. And you know, hopefully, by the time we're talking next year, this is a national platform and a worldwide platform. Um, I can promise you one thing, I'm not going to stop. And I'm going to continue this drive uh, because uh, there's inequality, and it doesn't sit right with me. So thank you, everyone.
This is a good day. It's a really great day. I'm Dan Malthrop. I'm the chief executive here at the City Club. And obviously, we're enjoying a, a really important forum featuring Brandon Krastowski, founder and CEO at Edwin's Leadership and Restaurant Institute. We're going to get to the Q&A in a second, and we encourage you to organize your questions for our speaker now and ask that your questions be brief and to the point. If you're joining us via our live webcast, now in HD, please, uh, and you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via the web stream provided by our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ, PBS, 104.9 WCLV, IdeaStream, or, uh, or joining us at some other point by, through one of the many radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Production and distribution of the City Club is made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Be sure to join us this Friday, September 25th, as we welcome Dr. Stephen Stack, the 170th president of the American Medical Association. We'll have a conversation on the evolution of the doctor-patient relationship. For more information about any of our upcoming or any of our past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today's forum is part of our Local Heroes series, which is sponsored by a generous gift from Dominion. We thank you for your support. And today's forum is also the Tom L. E. Bloom Memorial Forum on Overlooked Citizens of Inner Cities, made possible by a generous endowment gift from the friends of Mr. Bloom. We thank you for your support. And we welcome guests at tables hosted by Edwin's Restaurant and Leadership Institute and the Edwin's Board of Directors and Students, by John Carroll University, who also graciously provided a tie for our speaker, <laughs> the Juvenile Justice Coalition, Lighting Demolition and Excavating, Portman for Senate, the R Strategy Group, the St. Luke's Foundation, the Catholic Diocese of Cleveland, the Center for Community Solutions, and University Circle Incorporated. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Now it's time for the City Club Q&A, our favorite part, although the speech was pretty darn good. <laughs> we welcome questions from everyone, including guests, and holding our microphones today, our City Club Director of Programming and also uh, Edwin's board Director, uh, Stephanie Jansky, and our Marketing and Outreach Fellow, Faye Walker. Our first question, please. Please stand. Uh, Brandon, great job today. Uh, Thank you. The work that you're doing is awesome. Um, the question I have is, you spoke a lot about on the serious side. Um, the question I have is, on the developing the educational side of the program, could you walk through that process? Obviously, you had a formal culinary education, so that was probably helpful. But yeah. I'd imagine to come up with something that works, it was very uh, time-consuming and difficult, and I'd like to hear more about it. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, that's a good question. I, I want everyone to remember this has been a 10-year project, and this isn't something that came overnight, and, and nowadays everything is supposed to happen overnight. It doesn't. So in 10 years, it, it was just about turning over every little stone, right? Look at every little stone, looking at my alma mater, the Culinary Institute of America. How do they do it? How can we do it better? And so on. I think the greatest gift was um, working for Charlie Trotter in Chicago. Uh, he was worse than my grandfather, Edwin. I, he was a, a tenacious man, but he, he gave, he, he did something. He did something mentally with the strength at what you could do. And he broke down every detail. I mean, the chives had to be cut on a bias so you could see a circle in between them. I mean, none of the little micro herbs, you see those little micro, none could be facing down. When you sat in the dining room at Charlie Trotter's and dessert came, the pastry chef could not put out the same dessert in eye shot of any diner. Okay, think about this. It was madness. So it was taking that madness and taking this, uh, you, know, uh, you know, perspective of where a, be a restaurant could bend and break within and pushing it to the limits and then developing a curriculum around it. And, and once, that was, um, once that was established, it was doing it in prison and doing that for three years before Edwin's open. And it was then giving it to, uh, you know, a lot of smart chefs and people who are committed. And, and that's why I've got, you know, Jerry over here that he helps out every day with and, and John. So it was just about... Where do you start? You start with the single most important thing, and that's what's important in this business, how to make a sauce. And then well, how do you make a sauce and so on and so forth. Uh, but it, it all stems down to um, fundamentals and technique. Okay? Uh, working in France, I realize they don't make court bouillon different than they do in, in America. Right? It's, it's a certain ratio. Same thing with, with pie dough, right? Everyone make pie dough. Right? There's, a, you know, there's a 3 two, one pie dough, three parts flour, two parts fat, one part liquid. Right? And then there's the cutting technique, those little peas, right? Your mother was like, make them into peas. Make, right? <laughs> right? So now we just gave someone a recipe that they can take around the world. So it's trying to transform all those, and the French cuisine does it best. Yeah. 
Brandon, yes, I love good food, and Edwin's has some of the best food in the city, and your wait service is second to none. Thank you. So I thank you for your vision, and more importantly, the tenacious execution of that vision. Thank you. But talking about reentry, one of the over, uh, overwhelming obstacles to reentry is the criminal record. So most of our employers here have age-old policies that preclude any kind of employment for a felony conviction, and even, I do HR work, even yep. misdemeanor convictions. So what is the current status of legislation as it relates to that criminal record, its ceiling, um, that yep. second chance kind of um, legislation? Good. Uh, I would say it in short words, it's shit right now. It's not good. <laughs> it's not, okay? Um, every, there's federal legislation, there's local legislation, there's legislation. The Fair Credit Reporting Act says you can go back up to seven years and look in someone's record, uh, and most employers uh, go back more than that. So legally, if you have two um, felonies that were uh, not, like if you get sentenced and there's three felonies on one, one crime, that's different than a separate felony. If you have two felonies together, it, it's more than likely you're not going to get that expunged, okay? If you have a felony misdemeanor combination or a certain one, you might not be able to get that expunged. Um, it's still, some things are still expungible, or um, you can become pardoned in. Uh, but the state right now is, is the same as it was before uh, with what you're familiar with. It's still difficult, but it's more cultural than it is compliance. So it's not the, um, uh, what's the FCIA that insures banks? It, it's, it, it, sometimes it's that, saying that you cannot hire someone here if you want to be insured by us. But oftentimes it's Chase Bank saying, we're not going to employ someone because of a felony. And it's diving into each culture and each corporation and saying, what is our policy? Okay, they can't um, drive a bus. Why? Okay, it has nothing to do with their offense. It's, it's merely the company's policy. So that's what these forums are about, is, is, is shaking down these, these leaders and, and saying, hey, take a look at this. You can change it without even changing it what the government says because it's possible. Um, that's kind of the wedge I'm trying to drive. And also, if we can leverage a lot of businesses to say, hey, we want to hire someone from out of prison, take that to our politicians, and obviously they say, hey, the people have spoken, then I think they're more likely to say, out with the old and in with the new. Uh, but you know, the, the, the true weapon that we, you know, we have is, is train excellence. You know, look at, uh, Johnny Manziel is a quarterback, right? He's had a trouble path. Right? Uh, Michael Vick had trouble. If you throw a touchdown... You know, or football 100 yards, people are less likely to look at that offense. And in the kitchens, we're training great students, so people aren't even, look, they're not even looking at it now. Different industry, but um, I hope that better answers your question. Uh, but who can tell you the exact law? Uh, Judge Russo here will be able to give it to you straight. Yeah. yeah. Brandon, yes, ma'am. Hey, when you started speaking, you were noticeably choked up, which choked me up. And yeah. you said that you weren't emotional. I get emotional every time I hear you speak. Okay. Your mission is—it's uh, profound, and the effects that you have already had on people's lives, and the way it will continue is just—it's—it's uh, it's profound. Um, we are so fortunate that you chose to be in Cleveland, and I was wondering if you could speak to the room about what led to your decision, why you chose Cleveland. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I say you're awfully soft. Um, you need to, you need to toughen up a little bit. <laughs> Aside from that, Cle Cleveland, when, write, when writing this business plan in 2004, um, I just knew that my life took a different direction when I, when I, was in, when I graduated high school in 1998. And um, I looked at the kind of the census and I looked at who's got like the worst public education in 1998. All right, uh, Cleveland was number two. Number two. That's what it is. Uh, it's not like that today. Hopefully, it's much better. I don't know where we rank, but that's the draw here. And I knew that they build these prison systems based on education and graduation. And, and they say some to a fourth grade level now they can start to predict. So I said, well, there's a the town in need. And uh, when the time was right, just packed the bags and moved. It was a very objective. Um, probably the easiest decision I had to make. I remember before I moved, the first person I spoke to was Catherine Staransky. Um, Tom Staransky, I think, is part of the uh, uh, you know, um, uh, historic preservation here. But I'll never forget the, the conversation I had with her at St. Clair and at Superior uh, CDC. 
these CDCs are so important. And she said, well, it sounds like a great idea. It was, I was going to buy a building called the Town Friar. Anyone remember that? I think, hey, isn't Angie's there? It was there, yeah. It's uh, Keen from Zanzibar and, and many other restaurants. But, yeah, that's, um, that was it. I'm not, I guess, uh, sometimes I can be very smart. I get off time to be very, very dumb. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, Hi there. Um, I'm Anita Edwards. I'm proud to represent Towards Employment. I'm a, a board member there. Great. And uh, thank you for everything that you're doing well, uh, with you. the face of reentry. I just wanted to share a little bit, you know, even uh, there's so many organizations collaborating to do this good work. And yeah. um, last year, we placed 464 people in full time and uh, employment, and 290 of them had criminal records. That's great. So um, lots of great work being done. And yeah. I guess my question to you is how are you, or tell me how you're collaborating with other organizations mm. around the city, Good especially question. if you find somebody that is not going to be able to go into that specialized culinary field. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, and towards employment, Lutheran Ministries, there's so many agencies. There can't be enough agencies. Uh, collaboration is a funny thing, a really funny thing, right? I mean, um, Ted over there, the, the gentleman working half his rate for, as an architect for Bialoski on the project, he wants to wear that tie, but I want to wear this tie, right? We have different visions, different scopes, right? So, uh, you know, I believe excellence is here. Towards employment thinks excellence is here. We have all these different ideas. So collaboration sometimes isn't, isn't the best medicine, and, and, I'll, and I'll be honest and say that. It's always preached in these foundations. Well, collaborate, collaborate. It's like, screw, screw it, man. Listen, we're trying to run a business. We're trying, we're trying to do what we, what we do best, and we're, we're trying to do it right. Okay, so with, with that said, we collaborate when we can, okay? It's not something we're going to force. It's not something we're going to dumb down or ask towards employment to dumb down. We're not going to ask you to, where collaboration really helps is, one, the voice. You said over 400 people on 290 or so that were incarcerated. I mean, that's like, that's something that's great to collaborate with. Here's another person, you know, out there fighting and duking it out. The, the other part of it is, hey, if someone's not cut for culinary arts, maybe it's manufacturing. Hey, Towards Employment's got a great manufacturing program. There's a quarterback. You know, it's calling, it's calling maybe you or Jill or someone, you know, that's got boots on the ground and saying, here's Joe, he's coming your way. Um, collaboration looks like... Um, uh, there's a community assessment treatment center called CATS. And I call Will Brown. Will, we need someone who needs help. And he'll call me one day and say, hey, I got someone who needs help. And we have this like two-way street, this dialogue. So collaboration, it happens every day. And it happens um, with phone calls and relationships, not pieces of paper and these MOUs. Uh, that's what collaboration looks like. And uh, I, I can't tell you, sometimes it's frustrating to see the division in the town, right? Because there's so many people doing the same damn thing, right? But I think people need to understand, it's not like we got to be in bed together, but it's good to know that we exist and we should play nice together. So I, I think there should be a new word for collaboration. I, I think it's the wrong word. It should be something like, um, well, I don't know. I'll think about that one. <laughs> yeah, but collaboration is it's essential. We wouldn't be able to take someone and put them in rehab. We don't have a rehab clinic. CATS does. We don't have an industrial program. Towards Employment does. Um, Passages has a great program. We send them to Passages. So. Collaboration is great. I just um, I want everyone to understand that it doesn't mean you have to change your business model. It just means have a good conversation and play nice and, and, and move the mission that you're both doing forward. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Brandon. Your, your courage and your honesty is refreshing. I just need to say that. Thank you. Um, having taught in the Cleveland School District for 40 years, um, I witness so often young people who have a lot of potential who have made bad decisions. And so my question is, and I know you're doing a lot and your graduates are busy, but do, have you thought about or have you developed a small speakers bureau to go into our schools and begin to talk to young people about um, heading in the right direction yeah. and, and trying not to make those bad decisions? Merle, I tell you, um, it just now came to me. I found a head for this idea. I found someone who could lead this project. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> Merle, I think that's a great idea. If you can, look, I'm not kidding. If you can lead it, please do it. Because we, we need it. We need to tell, we need, there's something also called pre-entry. 
right, before someone comes in, not just re-entry, pre-entry. So the more we can get to help out, uh, Merle, we'll, we'll do it. If not, um, at the time we got another project. <laughs> thank you. Oh. Um, Brandon, thank you so much for what you do. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I really appreciate the opportunity that you give many of my clients. Um, for many of my clients in reentry, uh, I see two barriers for them that I think are not well known or well addressed, and I wonder if Edwin's has any component to address those. Uh, the first is access to your child, or if not access, the ability to have a say in what affects their lives, because yep. uh, certainly as a parent that's important. And the other one is addressing child support concerns. Many people who are incarcerated come out with huge amounts of debt that weigh them down for a long time. Yeah. Uh, does Edwin's currently have any partners they're working with or anything that they're doing to address those? Oh, you better believe it. So answer question one. When it comes to anything with legal, um, Cynthia Morgan here, who deals in juvenile corrections and, and whatnot, she's also a board member, is, is, is an ear to listen to, and, and she swings a strong bat. Um, there's, there's others like this. You know, there's people from Jones Day or from, from other firms that say, how can we help? We'll do it for free. So what we have is a case manager, and any need that's, that's needed, we just look at and we start making the phone call. So that's how we do it on a very basic level. The second part, at Edwin's, they're not employees. They're students. Right, we're a state licensed school. The state of Ohio has granted us a certification for a 900, uh, 900 hour diploma, right? Therefore, we don't pay them the traditional route of a W 4. You're paid with a 1099. And not an independent contractor, but the money you receive is a stipend. They can't touch that, number one. Now, you'll say that's good and bad. Well, it is. It may be good if someone's in a tight spot, but it may be bad because you know, there's a child waiting for, you know, for food, right? It's, that's difficult. That's the short-term fix for someone to get on their feet, work within the legal system, work with attorneys like Cynthia or Melanie, another board member, and try to establish either A, a payment plan, um, or my wife over here. Where's Katana? She's out. I mean... <laughs> Well, good thing she's out there. I, she's an attorney as well. I mean, what, what she'll do or what Cynthia or Melanie will do is, is call the courtroom. Say, hey, here's, my client is here with her child support, and they're only making this much and so on and so forth. So there's ways to, to you know, um, reshape what they have to pay. There's avenues to put you know, things on a different payment plan or different structure. Uh, but those are the two biggest problems we have when it comes to financial stability in, in, a, in a student's return because, you know, the stipend that we pay, you know, students are paid, you know, and it's not a lot. And when you take another 40% of that, then you're left with very little. So uh, there's other ways around it, though. So the first, I mean, you, you try to attack it with the right way, the plan. Second way, how can we do something different within their lifestyle to make it, you know, affordable to pay this, what they have to do, and still survive? So we, food stamps, right? Everyone knows about SNAP. Like, we take SNAP at Edwin's. I went downtown and got this little vendor's badge, you know, those little braids. And, and now I can accept SNAP, which means for unprocessed raw food. So what do we do? We have a sign-up list. Students say, I want chicken, I want this. We order it through our distributors. It's already 30% less, and it's healthier. And then there they go. Swipe your card, here you go. So we cut, we cut their... <laughs> we, we cut their cost of living down 30% when child's up 40%. So there's all these ways to look at it. Again, it's just about looking at something and saying, we're going to fix this, we're going to fix this, we're going to fix this, we're going to fix this. But uh, those attorneys are the first and foremost to help us out, so thank you. I'm Jack Connery. I'm a, a physician and a health law consultant here in Cleveland. Uh, more importantly, I'm a, a friend and frequent guest of, uh, of Brandon's, a, a delicious and inspiring experience. Uh, when I came today, I ran into Dan, I got here a bit early, he asked me if I was Brandon's father. <laughs> I'm not his father or his mother, but if I were, I would be so immensely proud. Uh, delighted with you. Thank you, Jack. The, the, uh, the question I had, Brandon, is, is this. Uh, you've told us about your first 89. There's 129 going to be pretty soon, and then 200 and 500, and gosh knows how many. Yep. Uh, the, the question I have is this. I, I have the notion that what you do corresponds to the first law of gravity, that a chain once broken stays broken. It doesn't fix itself. Recidivism uh, can be a familial illness. It affects generations, not just single 
people. It's not a one half turn of the wheel sort of thing. And I wonder if, if you have plans or you would think about making plans to follow your graduates, not only in their own person, mm -hmm. but in their families, their children particularly, yeah. to see that what you've broken and fixed stays that way. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. Hey, um, I mean, that's, that's a great point, and, um, and I love your passion for it. So right now we have an in-house you know, tracking system. Tracking system sounds dangerous. What it is is a, uh, it's just record keeping. So I mean, every three months we're checking in with our graduates, you know, whether it's 89 or 109 or so many. Every three months we hit them, how are you doing, what's going on? The families, this is the important part. It's developing a relationship with the student. Okay, This student, the closer we can get to their circle, and their system of support, whether it's a sponsor for addiction, whether it's a, a mother, a pastor, whoever it may be that's influential in their life, the closer we can get to them, we start to develop this like uh, duck press, right? It squeezes. You know, Edwin's on this side, the family on this side. We communicate. We're not going to miss a beat. And we kind of, it's hard to have access to the family, to what's important to them, until there's an element of trust, until there's an element of family. And sometimes it doesn't happen until month three or four, but uh, we, we strive for that. And we, we, we know that, hey, if you were incarcerated or your family was incarcerated, the likelihood of your child is, is all the more likely. That's great, Jack. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Hit that bell. Again, today, ladies and gentlemen at the City Club, we've been enjoying the forum uh, with Brandon uh, E. Krutowski founder and CEO of Edwin's Leadership and Restaurant Institute. I want to thank you and thank Brandon um, for this forum is now adjourned.